Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The speaker you are listening to is Imam Muhammad Asi. Imam Asi is the leader of Muslims in the metropolitan Washington D.C. area. He previously led the daily and Jumu'ah prayers inside the Islamic Center. His teachers were inspiring, revolutionary, and thought-provoking, which eventually irritated and threatened the Middle East ambassadors who controlled the masjid. Finally, the Imam, his family, and other Muslims faithful to the cause of Islam were forced out into the streets. This khutbah originates from the sidewalk across the street from the Islamic Center, currently under siege. رب الخلائق أجمعين رب الأولين والآخرين ربنا ورب آبائنا الأولين الحمد لله لا يعجب عنه مثقال ذرة ألا يعلم من خلق وهو اللطيف الخبير وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير سبحانه وتعالى عما يقولون علوا كبيرا الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحانه عما يشركون عالم الغيب والشهادة لا يطلع على غيبه إلا من ارتضى قل لو كنت أعلم الغيب لاستكثرت من الخير وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله قل إنما أنا بشر مثلكم يوحى إلي أنما إلهكم إله واحد فمن كان يرجو لقاء ربه فليعمل فليعمل عملا فليعمل عملا صالحا ولا يشرك بعبادة ربه أحدا من أطاع الرسول فقد أطاع الله وما أرسلناك عليهم حفيظا 
ما أنت عليهم بوكيل فذكر بالقرآن من يخاف وعيد أما بعد كمد مسلم disciples of the Quran and the Prophet in whose heart and in whose mind Allah Jalla wa'ala is always present in our particular time with the eventualities around us and there is no way to avoid self-criticism one of the statements that was pronounced from that first generation of Muslims who were in a sense manufactured by the Qur'an and the Sunnah one of those towering images said رحم الله امرأ أهدى إلي عيوب نفسي Blessed by Allah is He who pre- presents me with the deficiencies of myself it's very hard especially in the coordinates that we are in where Allah has placed us imagine speaking about ourselves on the street in public This is not an easy task. This is something people usually do behind closed doors. But a khutbah is a khutbah. And the truth is the truth. It's not our choice to say these in the condition that we are in. We leave this affair to Allah Jalla wa'ala. One of the characterizations of the Muslims of today especially those who consider themselves to be active committed sincere Muslims one of their features is that it is very important and almost the deciding factor to have the elite convinced about Allah's words, the validity of the Qur'an, the authority of the Prophet, and this impeccable message of Islam. To them, the number one priority is to try to convince the elite of Islam's legitimacy and validity. And that's why we have a current Islamic agenda that has taken on the duties of lobbying for Allah or for the Prophet 
or for the interest of the Muslims. This lobbying effort is almost now the central Islamic activity in the United States and Europe and the West and also even within Muslim countries these dedicated Muslims want to carry this Islam and convince Al-Mala the elite of the legitimacy and validity and legality and practicality and only solution status that belongs to Allah and the Prophet. And to some people this has almost become an obsession. All the other types of Islamic publicity are irrelevant when this operation is in progress. And we even find the dedicated brothers and sisters of several years ago jumping on this lobbying effort of these Muslims nowadays. Even Muslims who used to be with us here now are very concerned with joining this lobbying effort for Islam. And when you forget about these individu individuals or personalities, we want to deal with a nafs. We want to deal with the quotes of the Quran and the Sunnah, see how correct this approach is and we find that they cannot find an ayah in the Quran the only ayah that they misquote and misplace is one that says that you will find the Christians to be the people who are nearest to the Muslims. They take this one sentence, they forget about the ayat before it, they forget about the ayat after it, they take this one sentence from the Quran and by that they want to legitimate what they are doing. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَقُوا وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُهْبَانَ وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ They don't want to understand this sentence in the scope in which it is located in the Quran. Allah says, you will find the most hostile forces towards the Muslims, those who are mushriks and Yahud. And you will find those who are closer in affection to the Muslims, those who say that we are Christians or Nasara. Because in the context of those who say that you will find monks and priests who are not arrogant, who are not haughty, who are not supercilious. So if there's going to be any type of lobbying that's going to go on, if this is what they find themselves comfortable doing for the cause of Allah, it's not with the mushrik, it is not with Yahud, it is not with the kuffar, 
it is not with the munafiq and it is even not with those who are nominal Muslim leaders rulers governors kings presidents but this is exactly the area that they are moving in. If there's going to be any lobbying effort, it should be with the monks and the priests who are not arrogant. By the wording of the Qur'an. And if we wanted to break that down more, it would be with the bishops or the cardinals or the ministers Ministers meaning religious minister, not government minister. Who are not, who don't show any superiority attitude. Any superiority behavior. Those who are meek. Those who are humble. And those who are friendly. But none of them are lobbying in these circles. Where are they lobbying? Where Allah prohibits them from doing it? Among the Yahud and the Mushrik. It has almost become common knowledge now that in order to gain favor of the United States government, you have to cozy up to Yahud. And everyone now is in a race to win favor from the United States government. Including those who are classified as active Muslims. Even those who were known previously as revolutionary Muslims. They are lining up to gain favor with a shaitan al-akbar and they are doing this in violation of what Allah is telling them and they know that there's not enough ayat in the Quran there are no ayat in the Quran to substantiate their position so they go to a hadith that is narrated by Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah and another of the narrators of the hadith and they say the Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu wassalam says لا يليق لمسلم أن يذل نفسه it is not the, the meaning of this hadith the Prophet is saying it is not appropriate for a Muslim to humiliate himself or to disgrace himself. لا يليق لمؤمن أن يذل نفسه. And then the, the Prophet was asked by the people around, how does a committed Muslim humiliate himself? And he, they were told that he exposes himself to things that he cannot tolerate. He puts himself in conditions that he cannot deal with. So they take this statement from the Prophet and they flag down all of the contents of the Qur'an they want to disregard the tens and the hundreds of ayat in the Qur'an hiding behind this quote from Allah's Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How they can justify this for themselves is beyond common sense. The Prophet was not dodging difficulties 
when he had to go public with the truth which is what they have to do and what we have to do we have to go public with the truth we have to do it with our minds we cannot do it recklessly we cannot do it emotionally charged without second thought without thinking about we are doing it how we are doing it no when we go public with what we have to say we do so taking everything into consideration so they jump beyond the sunnah of the prophet they jump beyond the ayat of the quran because they say they don't want to disgrace themselves you can detect an air of a superiority complex in these types of people okay let us look at what the Quran what Allah's words say when people just like we just like them when we are given the duty and the task to communicate Allah's word let's take it from the beginning when Nuh communicated Allah's words what did the elite say to him قَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ إِنَّا لَنَرَاكَ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ the elite of his society told him we see that you are in a manifest perversion oh but you can't say that this to these lobbying Muslims they don't want to disgrace themselves well was Nuh disgracing himself how did Nuh put himself into a position that contradicts what the Prophet said and we go from Nuh to Hud and his people Ad قال الذين قال الملأ الذين كفروا من قومه إنا لنراك في سفاهة Hud was living in a civilizational context just like today we have this western civilization there was a civilization of Ad and a civilization always has its elite the upper crust of society just like the government officials the well-to-do in the business community the executives the multi-millionaires, the tycoons these are circles of power and affluence and finances that make up the elite of societies in a civilizational setup and those who deny this truth how can you deny a truth if it's not communicated obviously these messengers of Allah were communicating this truth and this truth disturbed the ears of the elite so they responded we find that you are operating in foolishness in other words you're a fool but our respected lobbying Muslims they don't want to be called that because they say they don't want to disgrace themselves according to their logic Nuh is disgracing himself Salah is disgracing himself Hud is disgracing himself قال الملأ الذين استكبروا من قومه 
للذين استضعفوا لمن آمن منهم أتعلمون أن صالحا مرسل من ربه قالوا إنا بالذي أرسل به مؤمنون قالوا إنا بالذي آمنتم به كافرون This is a dialogue, an exchange of opinion between these influential circles of society, the ones who have shown a history of opposition to Allah and His Prophet and those who are working the will of Allah and the method of His Prophet. They said to those who committed themselves to Allah and those who were found to be powerless in this regard. لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَنِ اسْتُضْعِفُوا مِنْهُمْ أَتَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ الصَّالِحًا مُرْسَلٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِ Sarcastically they're saying, they're making fun. They're saying, do you know that Salih has been commissioned by his sustainer. He has a message from God, from heaven. And they chuckle. You can see the chuckle in the way the ayah is presented. أَتَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ الصَّالِحَ مُرْسَلٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِ And then these powerless, committed Muslims say, said, reply, إِنَّا بِالَّذِي أُرْسِلَ بِهِ مُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, we are committed to what has been given to him to communicate to us. Qalu, and then they respond. Look at the elite, they're always responding. And when we say this, we hope no thinking Muslim supposes we are speaking strictly history here. We are speaking what is happening in our time. Salah may have another designation. And Mala may have another representation. And Ladina Stubaifu may have another counterpart. But they are all here. And they also, you can hear them in the street to authenticate what Allah is saying. These people who lack any means of power, they said, yes, we are committed to what Salah has brought us from Allah. And then the elites fire back, إِنَّا بِالَّذِي آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ كَافِرُونَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا مِنْهُمْ إِنَّا بِمَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ كَافِرُونَ These arrogant, these superiority laden, human, representations on earth, they say, if that is what you are committed to, that is exactly what we are denying. And there's a whole world, a whole industry of profits and interests that are thriving on denying Allah from our lives. And in the meantime, these convenient lobbying da'is carry on and the misery of the Muslims increases. Not that, that it's a bad thing, because Muslims need an injection of reality to wake up to the fact of life. And we come down to the Prophet's days, the final Prophet. When he was busy communicating this message to the public when he was in the Kaaba and when he was in the position of sajda he was in his sujood prostrating himself with his head on the ground to Allah one of these opponents came to him in that position 
Remember, the Prophet of Allah والسلام, had no visible power. We're not talking about a person here who has an immense budget or who has armies that can defend what he is saying. He was exposed to the elements of society. And then one of these opponents, these enemies of Allah, come to him when he is in that position, in the Kaaba itself, and places the placenta of an animal, the afterbirth, flesh and blood, leftovers of a camel. He places that on the back of the Prophet in his sajda. It would seem like the Prophet, understanding the Prophet's hadith that we quoted earlier, the way these lobbying da'is do today, you would think that the Prophet is contradicting himself because he is disgracing himself. And he says, don't disgrace yourself self, by placing yourselves in positions that make you susceptible to pressures that you cannot bear. He communicated this da'wah and he placed himself in positions that are very demanding. And what did the Prophet say after that? He remained in his sajda. He didn't jump up, yell at them. You know, the haq was on his side. side. The haq was in his hand. He didn't bounce back at them with superior language, which he had. With superior logic, which he had. He remained in his sajda. And his daughter came and removed those elements from his back. When we watch this scenario, we are also exposed to the fiqhi technical minds that would tell you that Najasa voided his salah. Look at what, look at the level that the Prophet is at and what he is dealing with, and look at the technical mind that throws itself into this scenario and says, well, that Najasa voided the salah of the Prophet. This is what we have today. They will argue away the Prophet's jihad, his patience, his endurance, his struggle, because of some fiqhi technicality on one hand, misquoting, misrepresenting, misplacing a Prophet's hadith in the face of all of the ayat of the Qur'an. And then, after he stood up, he finished his salah, he said, Allahumma alayka mala'a Quraysh. And then he named Abu Jahl and al mughira and Uqba. When he said that, when you read, when you look, at these events as they unfold and you come to today's Muslim mind you find that today's Muslim mind is vacant of the Prophet's enemies and opponents you go to these people who listen to the khutbah in these types of messages and you ask them who are the Prophet's enemies? the educated one will give you a name or two if the Prophet only had one or two enemies in Mecca and in the Arabian Peninsula, then why was all of this resistance and all of this patience and all of this endurance and all of these pressures that came to bear on him that led to assassina an assassination attempt, that led him to political exile and asylum, that had a hijra and a Nusra concept in Islam? He only had one or two enemies. What happened to this Muslim mind? And then they say, oh, the Prophet only says, he generalizes. He says the kafirin and the mushrikeen. He never calls his enemy by name. Why did he in this hadith 
after this incident, when they placed this leftover of a birth effect on his back in the Kaaba, why did he name three enemies of Allah by name? And then the three of them in the first war of Islam, in the first battle of Islam, these three that he named by name were killed in Badr and thrown into the burial ditch after the war was over. And then we have the lobbyists go on, contradicting the flow of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. There's a statement that was said a thousand and four hundred years ago by an observer, a Bedouin, a nomad, a tribal person, a primitive individual who just was observing. He was watching what was going on between the Prophet and the society that was resisting him. He said a statement that is still quoted in many books. He said, referring to the Qur'an and Islam, إِنَّ هَذَا أَمْرٌ تَكْرَهُهُ الْمُلُوكِ After listening to what the Prophet is saying and what he means, and after watching the way they objected to him, they persecuted him, they tortured people with him, they displaced people around him, they forced him to send other Muslims outside of the peninsula, they forced him himself to go to a ta'if, and all of that finally ended with him having to leave to al Medina. This observer, watching all of this, said, this affair, meaning the affair of Islam, is one that kings hate. Inna hadha amrun takrahuhu al-muluk. This objective nomad understood more about Islam and what's it about then we have these active Islamist lobbying guys understanding and doing today. And then we have individuals who we know who are supposed to know better joining this lobbying operation that has no basis, no foundation, no rationalization, and no substantiation of facts in the Qur'an or in the model of the Prophet is Sunnah. None of it whatsoever. What do you do? And don't misunderstand this. This message of Islam is for all the public. Whether they are the elite with power or whether they are the commoners without power. لِتُنْذِرَ أُمَّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا To bring an ultimatum to the mother of societies, meaning Mecca, and to its surrounding area. The Prophet was going public with the words of Allah. And that's what we should be doing. We should not be trying to cut corners, 
come up with a magical formula this will demand our time and our effort and they are discomfort, discomforted more than we are let's take a very brief look at the society there's a, there's a, a circle of elite in this society, no doubt. And they are not only elites of the society, they are <coughs> elites of the world. <coughs> and see how they are suffering and how they need this Islam. In their animosity to us and what we stand for, this is what's happening inside their homes, inside their neighborhoods and their society. By words, of research, not by words in the media. Of course, they don't want to publicize this. It's an indirect way of giving credibility to the Muslims. In just a generation or two, the di their divorce rate has doubled. Teenagers, in the same period of time, the number of teenagers who are committing suicide has tripled, went up three times. Serious crime in society has gone up four times. Babies who are born to a single parent have gone up six times. People who are living together without the bonding of a sacred marriage, in other words, without the blessings of God for that marriage, whether it's a civil marriage, whether it's a convenience marriage, whether it's cohabitation, or the other, many other names they have for it. That has gone up seven times. The automobiles, you can just take a look at the luxurious automobiles that they drive. Paying much less for it than in other industrialized countries, probably the least that is paid for a gallon of gasoline in the industrialized world is paid here. The national budget is showing a surplus. Inflation is going down. The purchasing power of the dollar is going up. They live in these contradictions medicine that they have is giving them longer life and is giving them more sex and they are more miserable after all of this this dawah that we have has to go, go out to everyone like the prophet he gave it to everyone and when he in as much as showed A psychological incompatibility in a passing moment he was checked by Allah he was talking to these elites at one time who you and I know if they come to Islam with them comes thousands if not millions of people and that's what everyone wants And then a blind person comes when he was involved in the intricate moments of trying to win over these elites and he frowns.
يسعك يسعى وهو يخشى فأنت عنه تلهى How would this ayah figure in to the lobbying argumentation that has taken center stage in Islamic activities here? We have to find Allah and we have to find the Prophet and the only way we can do that is by understanding Allah and His Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أدعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله هو السواب الرحيم الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم صلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة ونورا وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم مسلم عن الصراط المستقيم In all that was said in the previous khutbah, there is a faint voice that may be heard to object to its Qur'anic and to its prophetic reference or references. But when we come and try to understand these ayat and these hadith in the world that we are living in, this is where some people will begin to object. If we begin to look for those who are devoutly selflessly, sacrificingly trying their best to live the life of the Prophet in these dimensions. When they begin to identify who the opponents of Islam are. If we come and say that the equivalent of the Prophet's opponents in those times are and then we begin to give names to the opponents of Islam here is where they begin to object if there was a munafiq in the time of the Prophet that we all Muslims agree to when we open up our eyes and our mind and see the munafiq in our time and we have the courage to say he is so and so this is where people begin to object but are we to be concerned with our objections or are we to go the full nine yards as the prophet himself did Why should we stop short of saying that the Saudi government is playing an anti-Prophet, anti-Quran, anti-Allah, anti-Islam role in our time, in our world, in our age, in our generation? Why can we not say that? And if it's the truth, Why can't we express it in the masjid? And from the minbar. Why can't we go public with this truth? If Yahud are those who harbor the 
the most irritating animosity there is to committed Muslims, why can't we go public with this and begin to break down Yahud to who those individuals or that elitist circle is today. This is the challenge that is presented to the Muslims of our time. We have to make that leap. We have to have that courage. We have to be in control of the confidence that it takes to say this and say it for Allah. When we're saying it, we're, we're not saying it for ourselves. We are not motivated by hate. We express our words because they are the truth. And we want the Muslims to take that step forward and be able to express the truth. Especially, think about our, our condition when we are not able to express the truth when we show signs that we are on the verge of expressing the truth and then they come in with war. We mentioned years ago when they put an African to represent the number one legitimating body in the world called the United Nations that we can expect more wars and aggression and bloodshed and exploitation in Africa than at any other time. And look at today. The continent has become a continent of war and they don't want anyone to think about this. Wherever you look, there's a war. In northern Africa, in the Nile Valley, Today, the war front erupts again between Eritrea and Ethiopia. This past week, they've been sending in reinforcements to Sierra Leone, fighting over the resources of the continent. They don't care much about these human beings. They want the gold. They want the precious metals that are there. They are fighting over gold mines. And now in Zimbabwe, it is heating up. A long racial line, not to speak about Rwanda and the Congo and other places. And this is considered a continent of Islam. And Muslims don't have the courage that it takes to present these, these issues from the minbar when our blood is cold. We ask Allah to enlighten our hearts and minds with the truth and to give us the determination and the willpower to express that truth to all and sundry. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizukna tiba'ah wa arina al-baatila baatilan wa rizukna jtinaabah ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد ربنا صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم ربنا بارك على محمد وآل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد والعصر 
ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن اظلم ممن منع مساجد الله ان يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها اولئك ما كان لهم ان يدخلوها الا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعيما يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون يعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور وأقم الصلاة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نسأل اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل ألم يجعل كيدهم في تضليل وأرسل عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل فجعلهم كعصف مأكول الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نسأل اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم 
غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل مما سد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد 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 اللهم صل على ولا نعبد الا اياه مخلصين له الدين ولو كره المشركون لا اله الا الله ربنا ورب ابائنا الاولين لا اله الا الله وحده 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 انجزا وعده ونسرا عبده وعزا جنده وهزم الأحزاب وحده فله الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت ويميت ويحيي وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير